Steve, the efficacy of mathematics in, ex in explaining the physical world, in explaining physics, is really remarkable. First of all, how accurate is mathematics in explaining physics? I don't think mathematics can be ever regarded as a, um, an explanation in itself of anything. And this has um, not always been well understood. Um, perhaps it's even still controversial. Physical theories aren't the way they are because of principles of mathematics. Principles of mathematics are the, they are the language in which we state our physical principles, and they are the way the intellectual tools we use for calculating the consequences of those principles. But nothing is the way it is because of some mathematical principle. That was not historically well understood. Plato had over the door of his academy, according to legend, the uh, inscription, let no one who is ignorant of mathematics enter here. But his idea of mathematics was as uh, the deep uh, explanation of things. For example, he wanted to explain the five elements, fire, earth, air, water, and the fifth one he called quintessence, uh, which is the material out of which the heavenly bodies are made, in terms of the five regular platonic solids, the five bodies that are the, that where every face and every vertex are the same, the cube, the tetrahedron, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. And uh, you know, it was really not mathematical science in the way we understand it now. It was more mathematical mumbo-jumbo. And uh, some, even some moderns talk about mathematics that way. Uh, Dirac, I think, uh, was responsible for exalting mathematics to a level I don't think it really deserves. I mean, he regarded his equation, the Dirac equation, which is the basic uh, equation we use to describe the electron in quantum mechanics as being the way it is because it was mathematically beautiful. And I don't think that, that was right, actually. We, we now have a better understanding of why the Dirac equation is the way the Dirac equation is. But it is still true, as Plato was hoping, and as Dirac was hoping, that uh, when we make advances in, in science, we often find uh, the mathematicians who've been there before us. We find that beautiful mathematics, which pre-exist the developments mm. in physics, turns out to be extraordinarily useful. What are some examples? Well, uh, a classic example is, uh, is the theory of symmetry, the theory called group theory, which is the mathematical... Uh, underpinning of physical principles of symmetry. Symmetry principles describe how uh, things uh, describe the ways in which things have appearance which doesn't change when you change your point of view. And the set of all ways of changing your point of view which leaves the appearance of something unchanged is called the group, the symmetry group. And the theory of symmetry groups existed for a hundred years before it was applied in physics uh, because it was developed as a solution of purely mathematical problems by Evariste Galois. Without any practicality well, whatsoever. No, no, that's right. Or uh, it's certainly none that had anything to do with physics. Um, I once used the analogy that uh, there's a spooky quality about the ability of mathematicians <laughs> to get there ahead of physicists. And I said it's a, a little bit as if when Niels Neil Armstrong first landed on the moon, he found in the lunar dust the footsteps of Jules Verne. <laughs> uh, and the question has naturally occurred to many people, why is mathematics so potent? And um, I have a few uh, tentative ideas about why that might be true. And uh, one of them is that we're w nature is described by laws which to the human mind have to be expressed mathematically and although uh, the mathematics that is needed to describe those laws isn't natural to us because we live in the real world we've gradually gotten beaten into us by nature by our effort to understand things that this is the way the world is not some other way that the world is well described for example in terms of symmetry principles 
that was not apparent for millennia of scientific effort. And it became apparent in the 20th century because the effort to understand elementary particles uh, forced us to introduce symmetry groups. So the universe is our math teacher. That's right. But it's not a very efficient teacher. We're not taking a well-organized set of lectures. It's, it's <laughs> trial and error, but we're gradually getting there. Another possibility is that uh, we only look for theories that are mathematically beautiful. Uh, of course, sometimes we can't be so lucky. Sometimes we need theories because the problems are practically important. We have to, for, for example, be able to calculate the flow of air past an airplane, the turbulence produced, because we want to know how much drag there will be on the airplane. It's not a, a fundamental scientific problem, it's a practical problem. So we need complicated theories. Once a, a, a very a leading plasma physicist said to me, pl plasma physics is the theory that describes um, gases where the electrons have departed from the atoms and are traveling freely, so uh, the gas becomes electrically conductive. And uh, plasma physics plays an essential role in trying to design thermonuclear reactors, for instance, because the way you make a thermonuclear reaction go is to get a plasma of hydrogen hot enough so that nuclear right. reactions take place. Well, he said to me, if you have an elegant theory in plasma physics that describes what might go on with beautiful elegance, it's guaranteed to be irrelevant to the real world. <laughs> I mean, the, plasma physics is driven to a large extent by the practical need to understand, well, some astrophysical phenomena, but also to try to make thermonuclear fusion work. And so the, the plasma physicist does not search for mathematical beauty. In fact, my friend runs away from it. <laughs> Uh, but when the aim is not practical but conceptual, when you're, you're trying to understand why we live in the kind of world we do, uh, the kind of theory that is going to be useful to us would be a theory that has great mathematical beauty because it's only in that way that it could have explanatory power. Um, if it's ugly, that means it has a lot of various discordant elements, and you haven't really explained much because you have to say, why is it that way and not some <laughs> other way? You haven't gotten very far. Um, whereas if it's beautiful, you have a feeling, ah, this explains it. E mm. Even though the beauty may itself uh, be a consequence of something much deeper, which doesn't have that particular kind of beauty, may have some other kind of beauty. Um, so that's another thing. We look for, th we look for theories that are beautiful. And there is a hope uh, that at the very bottom there will be something completely beautiful. That there is a hope that, um, you know, as, as the poet Vaughan said, if, if any beauty I did, I'm not sure I'm quoting this exactly, if ever any beauty I did see which I desired and got was but a dream of thee, we dream of a beautiful theory that will be completely beautiful.